Section two of the Citizens Almanac. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two Patriotic Anthems and Symbols of the United States. Beginning early in our nation's history, citizens have used songs, poems, and symbols to express the ideals and values of the United States. From solemn oaths such as the Pledge of Allegiance and the Oath of Allegiance, which one must take to become a citizen, to the more informal tradition of singing the Star-Spangled Banner before sporting events, spoken expressions have always been an important part of American civic life. As you will learn in this section, these songs and poems often came from a writer's personal interpretation of America's ideals, as with the story of Emma Lazarus and the New Colossus. The values in history of the United States are also expressed through visual symbols, such as the Great Seal of the United States and the Flag of the United States of America. Around the world these two emblems are used to symbolize our solidarity as a nation. The following section will introduce you to the history and meaning behind some of our most important patriotic anthems and symbols. The Star-Spangled Banner, 1814, by Francis Scott Key. The Star-Spangled Banner is the national anthem of the United States. It was written by Francis Scott Key after a critical battle in the War of 1812. Key, a lawyer and amateur poet, had been sent to Baltimore, Maryland, to secure the release of Dr. William Beans, an American taken prisoner by the British. Boarding a British ship for the negotiations, Key was treated with respect by the British officers, who agreed to release Dr. Beans. Although the mission was completed, the British were about to attack Fort McHenry, the American fort guarding Baltimore, and so they did not allow the Americans to return to shore. For twenty-five hours British gunboats shelled Fort McHenry. The Americans withstood the attack, and on the morning of September 14, 1814, Key peered through clearing smoke to see an enormous American flag waving proudly above the fort. Key was so inspired by this sight of the American flag that he began a poem to commemorate the occasion. He wrote the poem to be sung to the popular British song, To Anaceron in Heaven. The significance and popularity of the song spread across the United States. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson ordered that the song be played at military and naval locations. In 1931, the Star-Spangled Banner became the official national anthem of the United States. The Star-Spangled Banner Oh, say, can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? AMERICA THE BEAUTIFUL by Catherine Lee Bates, 1893. America the Beautiful was written in 1893 by Catherine Lee Bates, a professor of English literature at Wellesley College in Massachusetts. Bates wrote the lyrics while on a trip to Colorado Springs, Colorado. Describing the extraordinary view at the top of Pikes Peak, she said, It was then and there as I was looking out over the sea-like expanse of fertile country spreading away so far under those ample skies, that the opening lines of the hymn floated into my mind. On July 4th, 1895, America the Beautiful first appeared in print in The Congregationalist, a weekly journal. A few months later the lyrics were set to music by Silas G. Pratt. Bates revised the lyrics in 1904 after receiving many requests to use the song in publications and special services. In 1913 Bates made an additional change to the wording of the third verse, creating the version we know today. 
For several years America the Beautiful was sung to just about any popular or folk tune that would fit with the lyrics. In 1926 the National Federation of Music Clubs held a contest to put the poem to music, but failed to select a winner. Today America the Beautiful is sung to Samuel A. Ward's 1882 melody, Materna. America the Beautiful O beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains' majesties above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all success be nobleness, and every gain divine. O beautiful for patriot dream, that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, 1883 As part of an auction held in 1883 to raise funds for a pedestal to be placed beneath the Statue of Liberty, which was a gift to America from France as part of the centennial celebration of 1876, Emma Lazarus wrote The New Colossus. Her poem spoke to the millions of immigrants who came to America in search of freedom and opportunity. She saw the statue as a symbol of hope and an inspiration to the world. In 1902 the poem was engraved on a bronze plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty. THE NEW COLOSSUS Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sun-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed, to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I Hear America Singing From Leaves of Grass, 1860 edition by Walt Whitman Walt Whitman, who lived from 1819 to 1892, is one of the most influential and beloved of American poets. As a young man, Whitman worked as a teacher in one-room schools on Long Island, New York. He taught until 1841, when he decided to begin a full-time career in journalism. Whitman established The Long Islander, a weekly newspaper in New York, and often edited other newspapers in the surrounding area. He also spent time in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Washington, D.C. By traveling to different cities in the United States, Whitman was exposed to how Americans lived in a variety of places. These experiences provided inspiration for some of Whitman's famous poems about his fellow countrymen, including I Hear America Singing. The poem was included in Whitman's most cherished work, the poetry collection Leaves of Grass. Throughout his life Walt Whitman produced several editions of Leaves of Grass. 
a varied collection that began with only twelve poems in the 1855 first edition and contained nearly four hundred poems by the time the final edition was published in 1891. I Hear America Singing, a celebration of the American people, was added to the collection in 1860. I Hear America Singing I hear America singing, the very carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam, the mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work, the boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat, the deckhand singing on the steamboat deck, the shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench, the hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song, the plowboy's on his way in the morning, or at noon intermission or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife at work, or the girl sewing or washing. Each singing what belongs to him or her, and to none else. The day what belongs to the day. At night the party of young fellows, robust, friendly singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Concord Hymn by Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1837 Ralph Waldo Emerson was a celebrated American author, poet, philosopher, and public speaker. He became the leader of a famous intellectual movement known as Transcendentalism. Emerson had strong ties to the beginning of America's fight for independence. His grandfather was present at the opening battle of the American Revolution, the Battle of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts on April 19, 1775. His family home was also located next to the battlefield site. Concord Hymn was written originally as a song for the dedication of the obelisk a monument commemorating the valiant effort of those who fought in the Battle of Lexington and Concord. The gunshot which began this battle is considered the beginning of America's fight for independence, and is referred to by Emerson as the shot heard round the world. This phrase has since become famous and is often used in discussions of the American Revolution. Concord Hymn by the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood, and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, alike the conqueror silent sleeps, and time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. On this green bank, by this soft stream, we set to-day a votive stone, that memory may their deed redeem, when, like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit, that made these heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. Pledge of Allegiance the Pledge of Allegiance was first published on September 8, 1892, in the Youth's Companion magazine. The original pledge read as follows, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Children in public schools across the country recited the pledge for the first time on October 12, 1892 as part of the official Columbus Day observances to celebrate the 400th anniversary of his discovery of America. In 1942, by an official act, Congress recognized the pledge. The phrase under God was added to the pledge by another act of Congress on June 14, 1954. Upon signing the legislation to authorize the addition, President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, In this way we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons 
which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace and war. When delivering the Pledge of Allegiance, all must be standing at attention, facing the flag with the right hand over the heart. Men, not in uniform, should remove any non-religious headdress with their right hand and hold it at the left shoulder, the hand being over the heart. Those in uniform should remain silent, face the flag, and render the military salute. Pledge of Allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Flag of the United States of America As America fought for its independence from Great Britain, it soon became evident that the new nation needed a flag of its own to identify American forts and ships. A design of thirteen alternating red and white stripes and thirteen stars in a blue field was accepted by the Continental Congress on June 14, 1777. These stars and stripes honored the thirteen states that had joined together to form the United States of America. As the United States expanded, however, more states were added to the Union. To celebrate the nation's growth, Congress decided that the flag should become a visible symbol of change and established that the American flag would have one star for every state. The design of the American flag has changed twenty-seven times, and since 1959 it has had fifty stars and thirteen stripes. The American flag is called the Star-Spangled Banner, the Stars and Stripes, the red, white, and blue, and old glory. To emphasize the importance of the American flag to the nation and its people, Congress established June 14th of each year as Flag Day. On this day Americans take special notice of the flag and reflect on its meaning. Motto of the United States On July 30, 1956, President Dwight D. Eisenhower approved a joint resolution of the 84th Congress officially establishing the phrase, In God We Trust, as the national motto of the United States. In God We Trust replaced the phrase, E Pluribus Unum, which had been selected as the nation's official motto in 1776. The motto, In God We Trust, can be traced back nearly two hundred years in U.S. history during the War of 1812, as the morning light revealed that the American flag was still waving above Fort McHenry, Francis Scott Key wrote the poem that would eventually become our national anthem. The final stanza of the poem read, And this be our motto, In God is our trust. In 1864, Key's phrase was changed to, In God we trust, and included on the redesigned two-cent coin. The following year, Congress authorized the director of the Philadelphia Mint to place the motto on all gold and silver coins. The motto began appearing on all U.S. coins in 1938. In God We Trust became a part of the design of U.S. currency, paper money, in 1957. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing has incorporated the motto on all currency since 1963. In God We Trust is also engraved on the wall above the Speaker's dais in the Chamber of the House of Representatives and over the entrance to the Chamber of the Senate. Great Seal of the United States On July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress appointed a committee to create a seal for the United States of America. Following the appointment of two additional committees, each building upon the other, the Great Seal was finalized and approved on June 20, 1782. The Great Seal has two sides, an obverse or front side and a reverse side. The obverse side displays a bald eagle, the national bird, in the center. The bald eagle holds a scroll inscribed E Pluribus Unum in its beak. The phrase means, out of many, one in Latin, and signifies one nation that was created from thirteen separate colonies. In one of the eagle's claws is an olive branch, and in the other is a bundle of thirteen arrows. 
The olive branch signifies peace, and the arrows signify war. A shield with thirteen red and white stripes covers the eagle's breast. The eagle alone supports the shield to signify that America should rely on their own virtue and not on that of other nations. The red and white stripes of the shield represent the states united under and supporting the blue representing the President and Congress. The color red signifies valor and bravery, the color white signifies purity and innocence, and the color blue signifies vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Above the eagle's head is a cloud that surrounds a blue field containing thirteen stars, which form a constellation. The constellation represents the fact that the new nation has taken its place among the sovereign powers. The reverse side contains a thirteen-step pyramid with the year 1776 in Roman numerals at its base. Above the pyramid is the Eye of Providence and the motto, Anuit Chapit, meaning, He, God, favors our undertakings. Below the pyramid, Novus Ordo Seclorum, meaning New Order of the Ages, is written on a scroll to signify the beginning of the new American era. The obverse side of the Great Seal is used on postage stamps, military uniforms, U.S. passports, and above the doors of U.S. embassies worldwide. Both sides are present on the one-dollar bill. End of section 2